Welcome back, JJ. It's episode 25 of We Were Gamers, where uh, we tell people what it's like to be a full-blown adult. That is what we're here to do. So here is how a mortgage works. You have to pay people that own your house. You don't really own it. You just own this piece of paper that says you get to live there while you pay the bank back. Same deal with your car. That's right. Uh... Debt. Debt instruments, financing. We're here to talk about that. Oh, wait, no. No, no. That's not what we're here to talk about. I think we're supposed to talk about the part that used to be fun, like playing video games. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll try and do that anyway. Sometimes we talk news. Most of the time we just talk about what we did the past week, what we played, what we had time for, and what we think people should waste their time on, since we don't have any of it. Yeah, we only have a little bit of time, so, you know, maybe only spend that time on good stuff instead of junk. JJ, I really know what you want to talk about, and the whole name of this podcast should just be Civ Six. So should we start with other stuff first, or do you need to get into it? No, no, let's get the other stuff out of the way, because uh, then it's just going to be just going to be talking about Civ. Oh, man, so good. All right, let's do the Blizz segment. We always do a, like a mini Blizz segment when we remember that there's Blizzard games. Blizzard news. Blizzard news. Hearthstone put out a picture. Woo! It says, welcome to Gadget Zan. All right, so uh, Gadget Zan is a place. Goblins and gnomes live there. We've already had an expansion called Goblins vs. Gnomes. That's true. Are the, is this Goblins vs. Gnomes 2.0? I don't know. I sure hope not. Uh, that just seems lazy, doesn't it? I, well. I can't imagine they would just do that again. I will say I had more fun when Dr. Boom was in standard. Uh, yeah, you know, I I don't know what they're going to do with that. We will see. It seemed kind of like a postcard. Maybe it's sort of like a adventure travel thing. Someone also found out that the domain gadgetzan.com was uh, registered. Oh, boy. Yeah. I don't know what that means. But it could be. Who knows? All this could be for, like, you know, some kind of elaborate trolling thing. And it could be, you know, like the Azeroth Travel Agency or something. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine that. But as with Blizzard, it's just sort of the two weeks leading up to BlizzCon might as well start hyping stuff with completely ambiguous Yeah, just references. left field stuff, man. Who knows what it would be. Are you excited? I'm excited. It's coming up. Yeah, yeah, man. BlizzCon should be pretty cool this year. I'm I'm excited. Still no uh, closing act. Yeah. I, do you wonder at this point, like, are they getting one? Is it just going to be like, they're just going to like gnaw this year? That would be a real disappointment. Two hours of Murloc Rock. I, we would leave. I assume. I don't think I would want to watch that. <laughs> it might be worse than uh, Blink One Eighty Two was. I I don't. Is it possible Blink One Eighty Two wasn't that bad? But they weren't good. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I've never seen somebody not want to be somewhere so badly as that lead singer did. He was. Yeah, you could tell he was cashing that paycheck and was like. <sighs> I got to do this. No, you know what? He was he was wishing he hadn't cashed a paycheck before he got there so that he felt like he still needed to be there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> He's like, wish he hadn't asked for the payment up front. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's as much as the Hearthstone news as I have. How about you? Uh, Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. You know, um, <laughs> there's, there's a, a promotion going on for all the Hearthstone playing friends we have where you can pick a person who will win their grand Hearthstone tournament, uh, and they give you free packs based on how many wins that guy gets. It's kind of a cool idea. I'm going to point out they're giving out grand tournament packs. Yeah, but it makes sense to go with their grand tournament, right? Or, you know, the ones that are going to cycle out in two months. <laughs> free stuff's free. <laughs> it's true, it's dust. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I th- I like the involvement. Do you think it'll get more people to watch? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, I Obviously, we will watch maybe a little bit since we'll be there, but we're not going to see every game, undoubtedly. So A few people I talked to said, no, I'm just going to click this button and see what happens. Mm-hmm. So. That was my approach, was that I'm just going to click this button and see what happens. I did no research. Don't care who these people are. Just want some free packs. <laughs> Uh oh well. At least they're trying. I applaud them for engaging uh, people through it and through the app, no less. You know, it's not like they had yeah. to go to the website to find out about this or anything. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's smart. You know, give people something to do. Uh, mm-hmm. 
But Andrew, also, we didn't talk about it. Just real quick, how do you like the new quests and stuff they have added in Hearthstone? Uh, uh, they added a lot of quests, man. They certainly did. And I don't know that I really want to play 75 Murlocs. Uh, but Andrew, it's not that hard to play 75 Murlocs. Right. Because you could just summon them again. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. I got... So after the new quests came out, um, my quest log was full that day. So I cleared the whole thing, and then I had three in the backlog. Uh, and were you sad to be disappointed and find out that, that doesn't work that way anymore? It does work that way still. Oh, I thought they said they changed that. No. If you if you uh, if you don't re roll your quests, it still backlogs three days. Okay. Gotcha. So like let's say you on day two re rolled one of your quests, then it resets the whole queue. Okay. Gotcha. And when I got my three new quests, it totaled playing something like a hundred and eleven different class cards from three different classes. Yep. And I just wanted to beat my head against the desk. Sorry, dog. <laughs> uh, I think they're pretty good. Uh, it encourages you to play like some weird stuff. Sure. One of the ones I re-rolled into was play 10 Divine Shield minions, and I thought that was fantastic for 50 and that's gold. That's really easy. Yes, it is. And it, I think it might be interesting. So so people understand, um, they've added new quests. Most of the quests used to just be win three games with this class, win five games with that class win 10 game or win seven games or watch a friend play a game. And in a lot of cases they give you like two choices of a class, right? Sure. Get, get three wins with either of these two classes. So you got uh -huh. a little choice. But... Or two wins with two. Yeah. Anyway. So it was mostly just related to playing the game and winning. Um, right. They have now added incentives to just play certain types of cards uh, because their tribe support in game has always been kind of iffy, you know, like, it's, yeah, it's you can play a Murloc bad, deck. Andrew. Yeah, it's been sure, bad. It's bad. You can play a Murloc deck, but it's not always been great. Um, so this kind of incentivizes, like I said, ten Divine Shield minions, right? Ten minions that have this attribute, Divine Shield. Go play them. I think this will revitalize casual play. Uh, people have reported already that it has. Uh, playing games in casual is a lot more interesting. You're a lot more likely to run into weird decks that are just like people messing around doing quests and stuff. I had one today that was play ten enrage minions. Andrew, did you remember that enrage is a is a thing? I had forgotten because no minions that are any good use it except for like one warrior legendary. It's the only one I could think of that actually used that mechanic. Uh, so I yeah. just threw together some warrior deck and I put in every enrage card. I just like you know filter on enrage. Give me every enrage card. Put all of them in a deck and it was just like I don't know. I'm just gonna hit people with the face and play the rage cards. Um, it didn't do the worst. My it's Divine like, Shield right. one, I played in the wild play mode mm -hmm. and uh, was literally just like Divine Shield taunt, Divine Shield taunt, Divine Shield taunt until the other guy ran out of cards. Pretty good. Uh, I don't know that it was good, but it was certainly enjoyable considering he was playing a ladder face shaman deck. Yeah, man. I bet he had a really bad time removing your guys. He was not very happy about it. There was awesome. a lot of wow clicked the emote awesome. not the awesome. game <laughs> awesome so good yeah no thanks for bringing up those quests i i was troubled initially but i do see the value in a lot of them and i think it's going to make like the lower ranks like because if you're at rank 20 you know like what incentive do you really have to play like quote ladder deck like not really just like play some random you'll probably you're equally likely to win at rank 20 as you are as at like you know rank 15 you know, it's just like those numbers in there. Eh, just play some weird stuff. I'm sure you, if you're a good player, you should still be able to, to gain ranks that way. Sure, and you can always build a deck that's not just like I did, which was 28 yeah. Divine Shield minions. And... If you just have like three Divine, you know, three pairs of Divine Shield minions in your deck and you just keep playing them, eventually you'll play enough of them that you'll mm -hmm. complete that quest. Yeah, and combined with the old quests, it actually might work out. Yeah. So, um... Anyhow. I, yeah, it was, I think it's good overall. Uh, I'm happy they made those changes. I was gone most of the weekend, which we'll get to later. But before I left, I had just enough time to try out the Overwatch Halloween stuff, JJ. Oh, cool. Yeah, tell me about that. I have not gotten to play it yet. The brawl is so much fun. 
Awesome. So they um, in Overwatch, like many other games that Blizzard does now, they have a sub mode of the game where they throw out all the rules of how things work, and they throw together a weekly match, uh, or in this case, by multi weekly um, match of crazy different rules using certain characters, etc. So during the Summer Olympics, they had they turned uh, Overwatch into a soccer game, kind of, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so for Halloween, they created almost like a, uh, a TD MOBA first person shooter thing. Uh, it's their first player versus environment match where you take, uh, soldier 76, McCree, Anna, and, uh, Hanzo. And those are your only right. four options. You have to pick one, and there's Ugh. one of each. So you, whichever one you pick, no one else can pick. You're not <laughs> exciting me here. Oh, well, you know, it's... They did it for a reason, which is that all the characters have voice lines. Mm-hmm. The entire thing is voiced completely. The whole scenario is voiced. So you hear a story going on during the match. I see. And... I have played it multiple times and I hear more and more of it each time depending on the like time and score and how, and what we've done in the match, you hear more stuff. Oh, cool. Backstory for characters like McCree asking soldier 76. Hey, you shoot like a guy I used to know. Are you sure we haven't met before? Or Anna and soldier 76 talking about their backstory, history, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, which is pretty cool. I mean, so I understand kind of why they did it. I think they also did it for balance. Um, so if you went in, there wasn't a chance that you guys picked four heroes that just couldn't win the match. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. You don't want to just have people accidentally pick their favorite hero and then just be hosed. Yeah. I mean, everyone kind of has clearly defined jobs. Um, you yeah. know, Soldier 76 clears out the... So um, they send waves of these zombie bots, basically. Okay. And the zombie bots don't attack you. They run straight for the castle door, which you're supposed to protect. And okay. they run so in... It's like a tower defense in that way. Yeah, in that way, it's kind of like a TD. They run in 3.5 lanes. One of the lanes is like a double up and down lane. Um, So that's kind of the MOBA-ish aspect of it. You know, they're, you know where they're coming from. I mean, that's also how tower defenses work. True, true. Um, And on a timer you have to fight off a kind of a boss wave type thing. So this is a, a lot more like a TD, I guess. Yeah, it, um, it sounds like a first-person shootery kind of tower defense game, which exactly. uh, those have existed before. Yeah, exactly. That's a um, cool take. It's a really cool take and kind of like explores Overwatch and the world of Overwatch. Not that, you know, like the Junkenstein thing is is canon or anything, but you get to hear more of the characters and you get to play as characters in the world of overwatch rather than having to just run around maps and take objectives places. You know what I mean? Overwatch doesn't have that much to do really. Sure. Sure. You get a little, you get some more story stuff because overwatch, you don't really get a lot of that generally when you're just playing. And even the brawls, the like weekly brawls that they do when it's not these special occasion events, Mm -hmm. um, they're just more shooting each other. Yeah. Right. And and I mean, that's fine. The game Pe- is about shooting each other, so it makes. And sure. by about, I mean like the gameplay of the game is shooting things and people. So you would expect it to be at that you know some level. Yeah. There's shooting. Yes, but I think that this kind of like brings in people like me that eventually get tired of that. Um, yeah, that's cool. I I really want to try it. Uh, before it goes away here. Yes, it does go away, I think, the day after Halloween. They're giving away Halloween loot boxes, obviously, instead of regular loot boxes. Some of the Halloween costumes are pretty cool. I wonder if we're going to get to a point in Overwatch when you can't, like, you're like, huh, is that Reaper? Maybe? I don't know. I don't know all the skins anymore. Um, So the answer to that question, I can answer to you from how Dota has been, because as you can imagine, Dota has been around a pretty long time. And not... Every hero, but all of the popular ones have large numbers of cosmetic skins for them. Uh, Some of which change the the look of the character 
uh, a decent amount, but never so much that you can't figure out what hero it is. And there, in theory, I guess the workshop people who sub- so a lot of the items and stuff in in Dota are made by the creators and then submitted to the company, and the company sort of picks its favorites in some method. Uh, and then the creators receive revenue from people buying those items, right? So if you have made an item and it gets put in the game, when people buy it with you know their real money, you get money. You, know, you essentially get paid for people purchasing it. So they kind of get work for free a little bit. Uh, well, the comp- Valve gets work for free, right? And they take the cut of the proceeds and give the rest to the creator. Um, but there's guidelines out there for how you can sort of modify these people so that they're still recognizable. They have to maintain the, the uh, they've said like the quote shape of the character. So like if you change something about them, it has to like still generally conform to the outline of the character. So when you just glance for a second, because that's what you're relying on in these kinds of games that are about, you know, reaction time and speed and stuff like that, you know, like a first person shooter or uh, these, you know, those MOBA type games in, in quick situations you really want to be able to just look for a second, know exactly what that is, and then go back to doing whatever else. Uh, and you, you, through design, you know, you can ensure that stuff like that won't get carried away. And I'm sure Blizzard is aware of stuff like that. Uh, they seem pretty generally smart about this stuff. So, you know, it's, it's stuff like where uh, I, you know, I looked at some of those Halloween skins, right, for the Overwatch people, and Junkrat has a costume where he looks pretty different from how Junkrat normally looks. Mm-hmm. But, like, his hair is the same. And he still runs in the same And he still way. runs with that, like, kind of, you know, the little gate. He's all hunched over, like, normal and stuff. So, like, that part, when you saw him in the game and you just glanced, you're like, oh, it's Junkrat. Because you could just, he looks like Junkrat. Even though he's wearing a weird white lab coat and whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, like, Good point. It, it's possible, even if they go crazy with that stuff, like, and change all the colors and stuff, like, you'll still be able to sort of figure out who it is. It may not be Im- instantly recognizable to like you or me the people who don't play all the time but the people that are in there playing uh or the you know the competitive players it won't be a problem something i wanted since overwatch came out was like i well, just give me a story mode kind of thing so i guess i've always been a little bit pining for that and after thinking about this possible new character they're adding and what that could mean for the game it seems like this could be a lead in slash primer for the fact that there could be some sort of like endless zombie wave td style thing just permanently added to the game after uh this next character gets added which would at least draw me into oh well i don't really want to go play a hearthstone game i'm not in that kind of mood i could just go play a td kinda in overwatch sure sure. yeah you know uh anything's possible you know i'm not sure how uh what they want to do with their their stuff there but um i mean yeah sure I, I we both agree that the the story things they've put out for overwatch have been really good those little short videos and stuff so more of that stuff sounds good to me yeah some sort of little pve things to give you more glimpses of that would be great yeah sounds cool i i think i'm excited about something that you may not be and i don't understand why what the nintendo switch yeah, they announced that thing. What used to be <laughs> called the NX now has a real name, and it's the Nintendo Switch. March 2017, we will see their third attempt at mobile gaming that plugs into your TV. Third? Maybe? I don't know. Uh, Well, they tried plugging in. They've tried before with, like, here's your GameCube, plug in your advance to your GameCube and play the game or something like that on your TV. You know? Okay. Uh, Sega yeah. tried it with the mobile Genesis plug. You know, you don't need a Genesis. Here's your mobile Genesis. Plug it into your TV. So this seems like a like like an extension of that a little bit, but at the same time, maybe that it's next-gen hardware? I don't know. Um, so, so I guess to give people a rundown, if you have been living under a rock, uh, the Nintendo... You can watch that YouTube video. It's pretty good. Yeah. it's kind of runs down everything that it does. Uh, uh, although or... they've said it actually doesn't run down everything that it does. <laughs> right. I was going to say, just now, I was going to say, uh, it runs down everything they'll tell you right now that it does. 
<laughs> Correct. Yeah, it runs down the stuff they want you to to understand about it. Yes. Um, Nintendo's releasing their next system. I guess quote unquote replacement for the Wii, and maybe even the 3DS. Possibly. Don't know. They won't say. Un unclear though. The game, it does take game cards instead of CDs. No more CDs. Um, and it does not fit 3DS cards so maybe the 3ds stays alive or whatever mobile thing stays alive for a little bit longer um but it, it's a i mean they're releasing it, uh, andrew they're releasing a pokemon game this year yeah still so 3ds's aren't going away no just yet i mean pokemon will sell copies of 3ds's for sure yeah so. but it explains why they rushed to get it out this year the pokemon thing yeah yeah um it's well, I, I would almost call it a tablet jj I think that's a pretty good explanation, Andrew. I don't really think there's any other thing you could call it. That screen is looks like it's around maybe seven inches, and it has two controllers sort of snapped onto the side of it. That sounds like a tablet to me. I don't Literally know what else you would call on. it. I'm yeah, I used that word. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, I know. And then you can snap them off and use them hand in other ways, which seems real dumb and not useful at all. But hey, I'm not a Nintendo person, so I'm not like their designers. So, Or you can leave them on and use a real controller. Yes, that seems like a much better idea. Uh, and then it plugs into a base station somehow, and then that then the game is up on your screen, and then you just have a normal controller in your lap that you can use at that point, uh, or some other form of controlling um, their little... In the video, uh, their point is that they have tried to create a system that is a seamless uh, mobile and home gaming system. So you would be able to dock it at your TV, literally continue to play the game that you are playing right now, undock it from your TV, put it on pause, stick it in your backpack, and take it to the airport with you and start playing again there. Um, yeah. It also implies, therefore, that it is not some sort of streaming service-based thing, that it is hardware-based, which would probably be pretty easy these days since tablets are crazy powerful. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem unreasonable to say that they could make, you know, a game at similar resolutions to what the Nintendo Wii or the uh, the Wii U, maybe in some cases, uh, could do. You know, something like a 720p type resolution and run it at whatever frame rate they want uh, on that little 7-inch screen, and it would probably be okay. Uh, the question, the real question is, is this how much is this thing going to cost? That's that's yeah. my mind, right? Is mm -hmm. it going to be... Because, like, these, you know... Andrew, you've bought one more recently than me, since I've never bought one. How much does an iPad cost? Because oh, that's the gosh. clear competitor six, here, right? Six-something six and change. Oh, okay. So an iPad is like six hundred dollars, maybe even more, depending on how much storage you get. Uh, sure, if you get the Pro version. Now they didn't show this doing anything else other than play games, which you know that's probably some kind of choice based on the trailers they wanted to show and whatever. So that makes an iPad a lot more useful than at least this, as far as we know right now. Maybe it can do all that other stuff. It's certainly not a telephone, and it doesn't look like it has a camera. They never showed it. Maybe it does, and they just don't want to talk about it. Also, does it have a touch screen? It has a big screen, like one of those screens that looks big enough like you would want to touch it. So, I don't, you know, like, I don't know. Uh, Why don't you want to get your smudgy of, fingers all over your screen? A lot of questions here uh, that aren't answered in my mind. I definitely agree with you that there are a ton of questions. Uh, you know, they gave no technical details other than saying what processors in it. You know, no it storage space details. Some NVIDIA chip. That's what's in there. Uh, Tegra? Yeah, it's a, one of their processors for, like, tablets and stuff. Yeah. Phones. Um, which guy has got to make a lot of people happy since they can actually work with the architecture and not be like, yeah. what kind of crazy special Nintendo chip is in here? Uh, the Nintendo's, like the Wii and the Wii U, were both power PC based, which are like at least like known architectures. But yeah, they're like not common for games, and so people making other kinds of games are like, "What?" Yeah. Uh, this would make, in theory, this would make porting your mobile phone games pretty easy, since there are phones and tablets that have this sorts of uh, architectures already. They did but, show Skyrim running on this thing. 
but if it the screen doesn't have a touch screen, I don't know how any of those mobile things would work. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know about any of that. I don't know, Andrew. I just uh, they didn't announce anything at all other than here's the name, here's an idea of what it can do. I don't. I see your point. I I want some. You know, uh, show me the receipts. Where's the? <laughs> give me the specifics. I don't trust this again. Let me right. see some. Let me see some details before I make up my mind. On I want to hear about JJ being arrested, breaking into Nintendo headquarters, asking night, for the receipts <laughs> night before releases, trying to count ballots. Yeah, I don't know about that, but <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, let's let's get some specifics before I start making up my mind. Like, hey Andrew, what kind of battery life are we gonna get? That's a real good question. Because, like, you know, how long can you use an iPad for on a charge? Like, maybe six hours, eight hours? Yeah, sure, depending on the size of the iPad. And, like, you know, how, how big the battery is or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that seems good. If you can't get six hours with this thing, that seems bad, right? Yeah. Like, so then, like, if, you know, you, you that would be less than in a, a, a cross-country flight. It seems potentially. Like, real that thin. Sucks. There has yeah. to be some sort of charger you like can plug into one of those mobile battery packs. Oh, right? I mean, I'm undoubtedly there's some kind of charger, but then like, is the charger in the base station, or like, is there a mobile charger that you can plug in directly to the thing? Okay, then, I mean, does it have like a headphone jack now? Dude, and you're... like all these kind of questions, like right, it's a lot of questions. I understand, like there are definitely legitimate questions, like the touch screen, but you're like throwing things out of left field here. Of course, there's a headphone jack on it. It's not an iPhone seven. They don't need to make it water resistant. <laughs> I don't know. You know, they, these are questions I have. Of course, anyway. there's a mobile charging option. In fact, some people are wondering, is the mobile charger what you get in the box and you have to buy the dock? That would be really if that was true. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. That's uh, it, it's not what I would want. Uh, you know, it's, I'm not because here's the here's the realistic uh, result of all this, right? I will probably never take this out of my house. Really? Almost assuredly. How can you say that? You don't you don't know that yet. Looking at the size of it, it would be the same as essentially carrying around an iPad. I don't have any desire to carry an iPad around. Like would you take the iPad on the bus with you? Or if I was a person, you know, using mass transit, would I do that? I would consider taking it on a flight with me, but then, like, I would want it to play movies and browse the web, which this can't do. Or can it? We don't know. Maybe it can. They certainly haven't talked about it yet. They only showed it playing games. So Those are fair that, points. That kind of stuff. If they want it to be useful mobily, like when I'm out, you know, if I was a Japanese person taking the train or if I'm on a plane or whatever, then I would want to be able to use it like my tablet or my phone. Yeah, maybe it can do that. We don't know. Thinking about, you know, our lives now and et cetera, uh, you know, personally, do I see myself taking it out of the home a lot? Uh, I'm not certain just because the type of games that so far have been shown for it are Mm -hmm. not games I'm going to be able to flip close my 3DS and come back to in six hours or two hours or 35 minutes. You know, like I don't, if I'm going on a cross country flight, half of that is going to be entertaining a child. <laughs> it's like right. Uh, I mean, playing, you, know, the, you know, playing a gigantic version of Zelda in that. The kinds of games they've shown so far are like open worldy looking type games. They look fantastic. And so, Andrew, you know, you're playing Skyrim. It makes sense if you could just like turn it off in the middle of whatever you were doing and be able to turn it back on and come right back there. That seems fine, right? Wouldn't you say that that would be an okay way to play that game as a person who has played it more than me? Uh, yeah, sure. If you could like click your screen closed and it would be fine. Yeah. So like that doesn't necessarily sound bad. And if Zelda is a big open world game like that, like they're sort of saying that it is, then maybe that would be okay too. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so there needs to be more information on that. For yeah, sure. totally. Totally. Uh, for me to make a judgment about how I would use it, I can't say now, but it does at least look promising like that video looks promising i like that they they did something different they didn't just like make a wii 3 or a gamecube 2 or they definitely did not try to throw more motion control dual screen we're gonna change your life stuff at you 
Right. I, I think like, they think this is going to change our life, but I'm not so certain about that. Well, yes and no, but like in the past they've tried to say this is what you'd want, you just don't know it. Mm-hmm. Um, and people were like, well, really, I actually don't want this gamepad in front of me that isn't used for anything except maybe selecting my inventory. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what? why do I need this giant gamepad Wii U? There's nothing I've used it for, you know, that, that sort well, of stuff. Well, so actually, or... uh, the, the answer to that question is, and one of the things that I'm actually worried about with this is that uh, one of the great games that made actually extremely good use of that gamepad is Mario Super Mario Maker. That game is amazing. One and game out of how many games? Andrew, I don't know. That's not the point. I'm just saying that that game is probably the best game on the Wii U. And they, if there's no, uh, like, so, you know, the theory is that you can't use it, you can't play on the TV and then have it, the screen in front of you as a, a second screen. It seems like you can't, they never showed that configuration as something you could do. So, and if this thing doesn't have a touch screen, then making levels in Mario Maker, if they bring that game forward, since it was the best thing, in a lot of people's opinion, on the Wii U, then like we're going to lose that game to a platform that not that many people have? That really sucks. I don't so, think you'll lose that game. Why would, I, mean, why would, I mean, if it doesn't work on the next system up, people will continue to play it on Wii U. I don't think you'll lose the game. But I think what they've done is say... Well, this two screen thing hasn't been a huge hit on the Wii U at least. Maybe on the 3DS it has been, but that's a handheld and you can see both screens at once and what sure. are people doing? What are they playing? How are they playing? Well, like you I'm said, not saying they're playing it's... on iPads a lot. So, yeah. let's make something that is an entertainment system like Nintendo wants but is also functioning in the way that people are doing their entertainment, mobile. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad idea to get rid of the second screen. I'm pretty happy they're doing that. It seems like a better way to go. Excuse me. Um, but I just want them to, you know, I don't want I don't want to see Mario Maker left behind to languish in the Wii U wasteland. I want I want people to experience how good Mario Maker is because that game is is real good. I'm gonna guess, given how hard they've been trying to push games into functionality on the Wii and Wii U and create this online marketplace that is more like PSN or Xbox's online service and less like their original, well, you buy stuff on your system and that's it, that they're trying to figure out how to move all this stuff forward generation to generation. At least I'm, that's my hope. I sure wish you were right, but there's absolutely, I would give it less than a 50% chance that anything you've bought on a Wii U moves up to the next system. Uh, that's fine. I don't mind holding yeah. on to my Wii U. <laughs> I I mean, yeah, there are some great games on there. I think people should play Bayonetta 2 also. A great game. Uh, but, you know, the it just seems like a really tough proposition because Nintendo has never done online stuff any good to say all of a sudden now they're going to have a mobile tablet-like thing that's going to connect to the internet and play Netflix and all the stuff that I want from an internet-connected thing and be have like a service like PSN or Xbox Live that's going to be great because Nintendo, it, that just doesn't follow for me. Nintendo has never been good at any of that. So I, I hope I'm wrong and they come out with something really great with their mobile partner and, and make great games for all that stuff, but uh, I'm not hopeful. Yeah, well, I'm at this point, we're still have to wait and see, I guess. It's early days. Yeah, who knows? Uh, I could be completely wrong and all that. everything will be great. Um, but, you know, hey, I'm sure they'll make a Mario game for it and that Zelda game looks pretty good. So It's interesting that they're doing it in March and it's like not even completely close to any sort of shopping holiday. Yeah, stuff releases in March, though. Like, I feel games Is that a quarter? Then. Is that like when a quarter ends? I feel like that must be a fiscal thing, yeah. Yeah. Like March is the end of fiscal whatever year that is got to make something look good yeah that makes sense well stay tuned once we hear a decent amount more news rather than the trickle feed of question answer literally a one minute trailer that's all they showed (laughs) more than that we'll we'll revisit yeah yeah all right jj it's time serenade me like sean bean with the glorious Civ Six, because I've been gone all weekend and I haven't even had a chance. His voice is a national treasure. For what is he? 
is he American or is he from like he's a Scot, I think. Scottish? I I think God, no, maybe he's Irish Irish? Irish? I don't know. We're not oh. gonna fact check this, but he's probably mad at us right now for getting it wrong. He played a bunch of Irishmen. Uh yes. Well, uh <laughs> I saw someone mention that uh he does die in the trailer. <laughs> So, uh, if anyone who was worried about him as the narrator not being killable, uh, he actually dies in the opening trailer. Oh, that was so, me. I thought he was he was yeah. gonna be uh, invincible. His, his character is killed in one of the scenes in the opening trailer. The All character right. who so he's talking as. Anyway, it says he's from Yorkshire, which means he's a straight up Englishman. Which an, he sounds... an Englishman. Well, in any case, they should be very glad because his voice is a national treasure. And also, he was in the movie National Treasure. I, I know. Uh, <laughs> and he is great uh and every time he quotes one of those little you research a technology or a civic and you have these little uh little quips and quotes from people throughout history and they're all just amazing um there's a quote from john carmack in this game about <laughs> rocketry not being as hard as people think it is because we've made it seem like it's really, really, really hard when actually it's just hard instead of being like impossibly hard. It, it, I slaughtered the quote, and it sounds much better Sean Bean saying it than me. Uh, it, like Courtney Cox has a quote, uh, all kinds of stuff. It's really weird the quotes they've chosen, and some of them are pretty funny. Only because he's reading them. It's just this deadpan delivery, uh, and <laughs> some of it's pretty good. Uh, that game awesome. is great. How many hours did you get in? Uh, I don't know. I could I could pull up Steam and find out, but I don't have that in front of me this exact second. I completed one game just before we started recording this. Okay. Uh, I completed my first game with a science victory. Woo! Yeah. This says that I have played 20 hours. Okay, 20 hours is enough to render some some information on people. And yeah, I could tell you about some stuff. Some opinions. Yeah. Uh... Let me have like a little story time here, and then maybe it will illustrate some points. I love story time, JJ. So I, I want to play... sit down. Hold on, hold on. Let me okay. get get your feet up. Get, like no, no. I'm gonna sit like cross legged, like I'm at the library. Oh, okay. You know, like I'm listening to to story time. All right. All right. Uh, settle in, everyone. Now, uh, I I was playing as Emperor Trajan of Rome. Uh, he was one of the emperors of Rome, and uh, he's the one they've chosen to have lead the Roman civilization in this game. Uh, and I, I played a game on continents, so there was like two really big kind of land masses separated by oceans. Uh, and on my continent was six other civilizations in an eight civilization game. Now, Andrew, that's a lot of people. It's on one pretty land crowded, base. man. It was very crowded. Um, now, is this one of those new world maps where then you go to the other continent and nobody's there? Uh, well, I I didn't, uh, but probably should have. Uh, probably should have. I did not found my city on the coast, uh, so I was not able to immediately start building boats and stuff until uh, quite a bit later into the game. Uh, but uh, and to my immediate left was none other than Teddy Roosevelt, our uh, American president leading the American civilization. Also a national treasure. Also a national treasure. Uh, of course, it was the Stone Age, so, you know, obviously there were no uh, governments there uh, at this point. But, you know, hey, he was just a guy. Uh, and, and we got along pretty all right. Uh, to my north was some uh, Brazilian leader named Pedro II. Uh, Sumeria was farther north of him. Uh, Germany was up there. And Japan was somewhere above both of those guys. I never really got to see him much because all the other people basically blocked me off from moving up to that part of the continent uh and like you know things were all right but like people were real angry at me all the time for just like doing stuff early on in the game i thought hey you know i i founded one of these new districts that's a holy site that's producing a lot of faith i have like some good bonuses with my faith that let me buy extra great people points and let me get some uh my faith spreading units a lot cheaper so all right maybe i'll try to do the religious victory um, the religious victory in this game, you have to convert uh, all the other civilizations' capitals to your religion, and when you do that, then you win. Um, so I thought, oh, well, I can produce these guys really cheap and pretty quick, so maybe I'll just pr pump out a bunch of these guys and run them over there and convert all their capitals. Uh, that, that didn't work out. Um, 
mostly because it turns out it's really easy to get other people's religions out of your cities unless you convert all their cities at once. Oh. There's a unit you uh so you can declare a uh like one of your you know you, you create missionaries that spread religion, and then you create apostles which are the same as missionaries but stronger and have the ability to declare uh they call it an inquisition and the inquisition it uses up the whole apostle so you can't use it to spread religion anymore but the inquisition goes on forever so like you know once you start the spanish inquisition it never goes away uh and how can it never go away it stays forever it just keeps going and it allows you to purchase other units with faith called inquisitors and an inquisitor goes to a city and uses his spread faith ability and it removes every religion except yours. That seems unlike pretty the real good. Inquisition, where it's it eventually had good. to end. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, wow. So I never got to try using an Inquisitor in another person's territory to see if you could like force out all of their people and it only install yours, uh, because Inquisitors are pretty weak, and you can actually fight religious units against other religious units in this game. Awesome. They call it theological combat. It's which like is mind fun. combat. It's pretty funny. The two guys like stand there and wave their banners at each other, and they each get struck by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty amusing. I was just hoping that they would beat each other with books until one of them fell over. No. Uh, it's The lightning happens. It's pretty funny. Uh, I thought it was really good. But the Inquisitors have like a weak amount of strength in those fights. So if you fight them with a real like uh, apostle or something... You guys are going to get blown up. Uh, it's really easy to accumulate a lot of faith early, though, and you can just use it to like buy tons of other buildings. I was using it to buy a bunch of science buildings uh, because that was one of the bonuses my religion gave me. So I would just convert a city to my religion, take that city over, buy a bunch of science buildings in it, and then not care what the religion ha- is after that because all my science buildings were already purchased with faith for free. So that was pretty cool. Nice. Um. Yeah, and so then I started working my way towards a science victory later on. Uh, I had to take over Teddy Roosevelt because he declared a war against me in a very unjust way. I had to teach him a lesson, uh, and so I did, and I took over his land. Sounds like um, your civilization is much all over the map, kind of, in terms of what you had well, to accomplish in one well, game. Well, so, so, you know, in, in the early game, uh, at some point, if you're playing well, you know, you're expanding and, and getting new cities and making your your area is bigger and developing stuff, you know, it's like, well, do I want to research this tech that takes 10 turns to research or this other one that only takes two turns? You know, it's like, so you end up with a bunch of stuff just from that, uh, just because you can, right? And maybe that's not the, cr- the fastest way and best way to play the game overall. Like, it's not going to get you to victory the quickest. Um, it sure makes dealing with stuff easier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen people online talking about uh, that the the AI is very hard to please. So if you are trying to get like uh, them to get into an alliance with you or something, it can be extremely difficult because they'll just denounce you and declare war against you. I would say there was only one Civ for like 90% of the game who I was on friendly terms with. Every single other one was basically mad at me for most of the game. I would say I was denounced probably like once every like 10 turns by someone for for nothing <laughs> it, it, seemingly nothing to me right i spied on a guy one time and then after that every you know 20 turns or whatever he just denounced me over and over and over it's like dude i spied on you one time like 400 years ago and you're still mad about it like let's it's like heard, get over it i heard a funny story about cleopatra okay she hates people with small armies that's true and she also dislikes people that have no money. So uh, I don't know about that second one. There are uh, the every leader has an agenda, right? So the AI, when playing as a leader, has a certain agenda. Cleopatra's agenda is, uh, I think it's called like Queen of the Nile, and it's she respects people who have a strong army like she does. So she tries to develop an army and have a strong army. And if you have a strong army, she will like your civilization more. Uh, the second agenda for every leader is hidden and random. Ah. So it's possible that they had one that she likes people who have a lot of money. Uh, that's possible. Gotcha. Uh, I found 
so, and, and like it a lot of times it will conflict in weird ways there was a guy in uh i think sumeria in my game that liked people who were industrious that had like a lot of production um and then also his uh, base agenda was like something about he didn't want people to be you know more prosperous than him and so it was like if if i was producing more than him he would like me but also he'd be mad at me and it, it stuff is very strange maybe um, they need to do kind of a retooling of what random ones can get assigned to people so that that stuff doesn't happen yeah i i think the dip, the diplomacy stuff needs a bit of work in this game things feel very like uh half baked it's not it's not clear how to make any civilization happy with you for like a long period of time uh and like just refusing to enter a deal into a deal with someone will later get you denounced it's like oh i want like give me this luxury resource that you have and you tell them no because you need it and then they go well too bad uh and they say like I i'm sorry we couldn't come to a deal and then like 10 turns later they're like you didn't make a deal with them so they're denouncing you like come on dude like what yeah that's... or like in another case i uh it was near the near the late game so like most of the land had been taken up by cities at this point uh cities had expanded out like way beyond their borders uh and like you know uh our two cities were land to land up against each other right and i had some units in my territory they were moving around going to do some some stuff somewhere else and this guy got mad at me for having units hanging out near his borders i was like dude your borders are literally my borders my units are all in my own land hanging out on, on my stuff, but you're mad at me for having them in my own land? Like, it's not like I was camping them on the border of your city, dude. They're just chilling near my city, which happens, your city is right next to mine. That's just how it is. So, you know, and some of that stuff is, you know, the guy was probably trying to fight me anyway, so it was, you know, hard to hard to pull the intent out of why that stuff happens. But it's just like th little things like that that are, like, how how is it avoidable, right? You don't really have any control over those situations. It's an interesting new system, but it seems like it's kind of hard to parse. Yeah, so far at least. I haven't really gotten my head around that aspect of the game. Um, but the rest of it is really, really cool. I really like this game. Uh, I think that maybe there's some, like, in the very end game, it gets kind of boring uh, because the, you know, the you have completed, in my case, I completed the entire tech tree. Uh, and still had probably 30 turns of hitting end turn left to go while it finished building the space projects that it needed to win. Um, so that's so not very exciting. And turn 30 times? Uh, yeah, more or less, yeah. I mean, there was slightly more to it than that. You know, some people try to attack me or whatever. Um, you can keep researching the final technology and the technology tree in order to get bonus points. So in right. case someone got to space before me, although I didn't think that was going to happen. Uh, you want to do that stuff, uh, you know, keep researching, change your civics around to make sure that they're good. Um, but yeah, uh, so that was kind of boring. Uh, the civic stuff is really cool. It's like a more advanced version of how they did in Civilization V. So give people a rundown, a little bit of a rundown on civics. So uh, in Civilization V, uh, I guess we'll start there, The uh, you would earn culture. And culture is just a resource that gets generated from your city based on, you know, having opera houses and museums and stuff like that uh, and you could build monuments and and these sort of things would generate culture for your city it also would encourage how quickly your borders spread and a bunch of other things uh, and then you could spend them on these like little tree little technology trees almost uh, it's like oh you could join the tr the uh, like honor tree and it would have a bunch of bonuses all themed around fighting and military stuff or you could join the mercantilism tree and then it would give you bonuses around making money and gold and stuff. And all these various different little trees would unlock as you progressed through the ages, and they'd give you little bonuses each time you gained a certain amount of culture. So they took that idea, and they just said, well, what if instead of all these little tiny trees, we just had one really big tree, and it worked basically the same way your science does, where you research a technology every turn. But what if you researched culture every turn? And you just had a big tech tree of different cultures, and all your cultural stuff is there. Uh, and so that's what they did. Uh, so it works exactly the same as science. You research it with culture, and uh, you unlock stuff like your art museums and your, your culture-related buildings 
uh, and wonders and stuff through that instead of the science tree. Oh, I didn't know you got buildings and stuff through there. Yes, and you'll so you'll get bonuses of uh, of little things where it's like, hey, um, you know, now you can have faster embarked movement or these little these little bonuses that they put onto cards, and then based on whatever your government type is, it has a certain number of slots for these cards. And does your government type give you a flat out bonus? Yes. Uh, and then the longer you stay in that government, so the government type has a bonus itself. Then you also earn these bonuses based on how long you've been in that government type that will carry over when you change to a new government. Uh, so for instance, one of them might be, Hey, this government gets plus 10% production. Uh, that's one of the late game governments. I think it's democracy or no communism. Sorry. That's communism. Uh, and then, but the, their arrangement of cards is like, it has this many military cards, this many social cards, not very many diplomatic cards and like a couple wild cards that you can just put whatever you want. Right. That's fantastic. But, but if you go to the, the democracy one, you get a lot more diplomacy cards. You get uh, a similar number of maybe the economic ones, but a lot less military and like the same number of wild stuff, but their bonus is different, right? Maybe it's like, Oh, it's easier to get great people under democracy. Uh, and maybe your trade routes are a little better. And so like all this kind of stuff, uh, and then the little cards are stuff like, hey, your units get plus four attack when fighting people of different religion than you. Or every trade route you establish with another civilization gives one science and one culture in addition to whatever else. Or like all this stuff. Uh, it's really, really interesting system. And uh, you can't go in and swap your cards every turn. But you can go in anytime you, you get a new civic researched. You can go in and change your uh, cards for free. Otherwise, if you want to change them, you have to pay a little bit of money. Uh, and you can't change your government too quickly. I'm not exactly sure how quickly you can do that, because otherwise it causes anarchy, and then you're in trouble, and that's bad. How so. do they handle the happiness? So happiness is not a global stat like it was in Civilization V. Uh, individual cities are either happy or not happy based on the number of amenities that exist in that city. So, like, you build a building, and it will provide plus two housing and plus one amenity. Housing is the number of people you can have in that city, so there's a cap. If you don't have enough houses, you can't grow your city. Uh, and the amenities, like, the more people you have, the more stuff you have, you need amenities to keep the people there happy, uh, and that keeps them, that city more productive. Uh, if your city has negative numbers of amenities, uh, people will eventually start to leave, uh, or they could revolt. That never happened because it's not that tough to just build some amenities. Although, depending on how your research is going, maybe you won't have researched the right cultural things to produce them. So, got to balance that a little bit. Nice. But it's pretty good. Uh, it's a really interesting system. I think the like early and mid game is a lot more uh, involved than it was in Civ Five, And definitely, definitely, the city planning is a big deal. Like, you got to think. Uh, by the end game... Uh, I got a unit called a naturalist that allows you to create a national park, which you can use to create tons and tons of tourism, apparently. But a natural park requires four tiles with no improvements on them arranged in a specific diamond pattern. And, like, I had improvements on most of my tiles and definitely didn't have four all next to each other that hadn't been developed. So it's like, what, how do I, you know, it was like at that point, my planning had not allowed me to use this high cult high tourism gaining thing so i was sort of boned uh, on that huh so uh, there's definitely a lot of and like you know the districts that you can create now uh you don't build all the buildings in the center where your city is right you sort of have to build them in these districts that are built on tiles in your city which means that if you get invaded people can pillage them or you know sack them or whatever and then your mm -hmm. city has to repair them right you have to use production to repair them not builders cool yeah, that's crazy, and it's, like, really annoying if a spy sabotages your stuff that you have to spend, like, ten turns repairing it. Wow. Yeah, it can be a real hassle. Um, so it makes the game really interesting having to do that. You have to think, like, okay, well, I know scientists get bonuses from mountains, and so I want to keep a space near the mountain for that, but then so does the holy site, so I don't want to put a temple there, 
or like a science thing there. And then we'll like, if you put a district next to another district, it gets a bonus. But then it, this bo one gets bonuses from a river. So I don't want that. And like some wonders can only be built in certain kinds of locations. So it has to be on a desert tile near a mountain. Uh, like all this, uh, and like the, the stuff gets really, really complicated. It's like, oh, if I build this district here in the only place in my city that I can, I'm not going to be able to get this wonder down the line because it can only be built on this kind of a tile. How clear is all that kind of stuff? Oh, because... it's not at all. You're going to yeah, get screwed. Okay. Yeah. Definitely your first time through, you are going to get screwed. And you'll you'll have built a district that you needed at the time. You're like, oh, I'm really losing money. I'm going to build this commercial district, get my, my banks and my trading markets up, earn a bunch of gold. And then you'll later realize that that district was the last space adjacent to your city center. And you needed to build something that can only be built adjacent to your city center. And then your choice is either... Uh, if it's a di if it's all districts, you can't raise districts with builders, so you're just stuck. Like you can't can't get rid of those districts once you build them. They're there. Uh, so you're either stuck or you have to take like one of your farms or your uh, lumber mills or mines or whatever and destroy that to put something else there. Whoa. Yeah. Not great. Well, and I'm sure figuring out optimum placement for something like... Is really hard. You know, oh, I I can put this city here so that I'm on the river and the mountain, yep. but yep. those two squares, then I have to, you know, like, mm -hmm. I have to make sure there are three squares here and two squares there and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think at some point, you know, you just need to found your city in a place that's advantageous to you uh and is next to a source of water right because that's how you get uh bonus housing when you found cities if you're next to the ocean or you're next to other sources of fresh water it's a lot uh you get a lot of bonus housing to start so you don't have to you don't your population doesn't run into trouble as it would if you built your city say in the middle of a desert how does that work are you just hiring merfolk or uh, i don't know that's how it works people from the sea yeah uh, it's just you know it's just it's easier to attract people to live near the sea than it is the middle of the desert, right? Good point. Uh, and in fact, late game there are seaside resorts that you can build there that add a bunch of tourism. Ooh. So yeah, uh, and you know, there's stuff like each tile has a appeal rating, like how appealing this tile is to tourists. And so if you have a lot of very appealing tiles. You can build certain kinds of improvements on them that increase your tourism, and so it becomes easier for to make other people want to visit your lands because they're pretty. <laughs> and tourism is also a way to win, right? Right. So tourism is the culture victory condition. Uh, it was how that worked in uh, the final update to Civilization V. They added that uh, and sort of changed how the culture victory works. So not only do you get these policies, you also get... Uh, you have to produce tourism. And tourism can be produced by, like, if you have famous art museums or certain kinds of wonders and now improvements that you can build on certain squares. Uh, and the goal is to get more tourists than an, more tourists from other countries than their domestic tourism. So right, the, the tourism of their own land you want to have more tourists coming to your lands than their own homeland, right? So they'd rather come to your country to look at stuff than go somewhere in their own country. Gotcha. And then you are considered to be uh, culturally dominant over them. Uh, and then that's one, you know, you need to do that to everybody and then you win. Sweet. Uh, yeah, it's pretty great, man. Wow, I'm having so much fun. I can't wait to play some more games. Uh, and there, apparently I found on the internet that there is a way to get, a a, uh, a victory against the AI in the hardest difficulty setting in one turn. Turn one, you win. What? Yes. It's a very contrived scenario. Uh, you can play, so deity is the hardest difficulty in civilization, uh, at, I think it's at level four. Uh, so deity is level seven, I guess, uh, on level four, it's an even playing field on both sides. The computer doesn't get any advantages, uh, beyond four, the computer gets big advantages. They just start cheating to make it better than you. Uh, and on deity level, apparently the cheating is really bad. And that's always been the case in the Civ games. The highest level, uh, would usually be really tough to win. 
However, you can contrive a scenario where you can win on the first turn that involves you playing one specific civilization, the AI not playing that civilization, and the maximum number of turns is set to one. <laughs> you, you start your civilization as Russia, who, when they found a city, their city like gains extra land immediately. Mm -hmm. So you found a city, it gets its normal amount of space, and then adds like one to those spaces. And the AI plays someone who's not Russia. They found their city. You win because you have more land. Game over. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so you win via the score victory uh, almost immediately. That can't be for the achievement. It is. No I have way. that achievement, Andrew. <laughs> I don't count that as having played a game of Civilization, but uh, it does work. I have no idea if they can actually patch that out or not. It depends. Uh, like They allow you to set a maximum turn limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you leave the score victory enabled uh, and you set that term limit of one, I don't think it's possible to lose as that civilization. Interesting. So they just... I don't think they care very much about they, their achievements. They probably don't care. Yeah. There is also, though, I looked through the achievement list, there are some really hilarious achievements in this game. Like, you have to do some really weird, contrived stuff. Uh, for instance, let me find this one because it was funny enough that I read it to someone else. And they laughed. Uh, uh, okay, the name of the achievement is Pizza Party, which what does that have to do with anything? You need to activate Leonardo da Vinci in New York with great works from Michelangelo and Donatello <laughs> and a sewer all in that city. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. That's pretty great. It's pretty good. Uh, there is a bunch of weird ones like that of like, do these crazy things all at the same time. So you'd uh, have to play as America and like trade for great works. Can you still do that? Can you still trade for great works? Yes. Yes, you can. Cool. Yeah. Trade uh, for a bunch of great works and then make sure you got the great person. Yeah. So you need the great person, Leonardo da Vinci, and you need America because you, you have, or you need to take over America because you need to have New York. And then you need to build a sewer in that city then you need to have great works by those other two people, and then you activate Leonardo, Leonardo in that city also. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, there is one for uh, called We Are the Champions that is win a regular game with a religious victory with your dominant religion being Zoroastrianism. At the time of victory, you were also the suzerain of Zanzibar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and suzerain is sort of how they've changed the city-states. Uh, oh, city interesting. States, now you uh you send envoys to them rather than having to give them gold or do uh or whatever you can still do favors for them and that'll reward you with a bonus envoy um but they're like just like it's just like putting points into each of these little city states and they give you the same little bonuses uh but if you are the the civilization who has sent them the uh the most of uh, the most envoys you get a unique bonus to the ver to whichever city state it is uh, and the unique bonuses are stuff like, oh, you can build this unique tile improvement that provides some bonus to faith, or you can buy uh, this one gives you plus two production in all your cities, or this one gives you like you know plus four gold to all your trade routes, or these kind of things, like really worthwhile bonuses, uh, which is sort of how I think the the city states were in Civ Five too. They were good. It was just really hard to keep up. Oh yeah, did they improve the? menus in a way that you could keep up better you know like in in civ 5 you could you had to click the diplomatic menu and scroll a huge long list of things and click individual ones to see where your favor was at or like to find units you had to click on the resource guide and then go find another menu like have they streamlined the menus enough that the game so, seems a little better so i think there's definitely a some work has to be done on the menus um for city states specifically they have their own menu you just hit a button up in the upper right you can click on it it shows all the city states and how many envoys you have with each one what bonuses you're getting from that that's it uh, if you want to see which civilization is the suzerain of them it tells you uh, or if it's you but if you want to see how close other people are to you you have to kind of drill down a little bit more in those menus so that's it's pretty good in that respect. But in other respects, some stuff is really bad. If you want to find just a list 
of all of your units, Andrew, so you can go through them. It's really hard to find that. That so doesn't you... make any sense because eventually at some point the map gets huge. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. Okay. It's, it can be really hard to find that list. You have to click on the name of the unit and it brings up a little list next to the, like a drop down list almost of, of units there. And that's as, as good as you get. Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, I didn't even realize this. Someone had to uh, post a picture online that told me about it. Uh, there's an XP bar that shows how much experience your units have. Uh, it is a tiny line at the bottom of the screen in like 0.4 size font or something. Man, it's really small. <laughs> I just assumed it was like artifacting on the bottom of my monitor at first. Oh, man. Uh, it's really hard to see that. Um, so if you wanted to know which unit, you know, if you had two units and they were both about to kill this enemy, you want to use the one that's going to get the level up first, uh, but you don't know which it is because you can't tell which one is closer to the level up. Uh, so that happened to me several times until I realized that XP bar was there. Um, thanks to the person on the internet on Reddit who posted that uh, picture and circled the XP bar because I didn't know it was there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of like really annoying stuff, but in general, like the the UI for the districts and what buildings you can build and stuff is all really good. Uh, finding out like what's in your sieve is pretty good. That strategic view is pretty useful, nice, uh, especially for like planning and stuff. Once you start like trying to move units around and stuff, yeah, I didn't find it very helpful. Um, but it, it's good for like seeing, okay, what resources are right here? Like, do I want to build a sieve here? Like a city here? I need to look, you know, that it's good for that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it looks pretty. It does look very pretty. Uh, the game in general looks pretty. So, uh, I think it's doing a good job there. Nice. Uh, yeah. So I'm excited to play more of that. Um, did you get bit by the windows defender bug? Yes, I did. Uh, and I, I shout out to the person on Reddit for helping me fix that. Uh, <laughs> also, because, yeah, I, the game just, it took probably like t two whole minutes to start. Like you just so, click on it and it just like sits as a black screen. Doing yeah, P nothing. PSA here for people then. Yeah, uh, if you are playing this game and the game won't load or it's like it gets hung on a screen of loading the game or uh, booting into the game, go to your Windows Defender settings and add the Civ 6 folder in Steam or wherever you have it uh, as an exception to Windows Defender, and then boom, all of a sudden your game will run fast for no reason that I can really understand. Yeah, it's doing something. It's trying to read the executable or something like that. Uh, completely unclear to me what it's doing other than slowing down and making your game run like butt. <laughs> it's it double funny too because when I first started playing I didn't have that issue and then I got that issue later so I don't know what it's trying to do there uh, really frustrating wish it didn't do that you know I heard some other news that made me sad oh no what you can't rename your cities uh, is that true maybe you can rename units though well that's that's good enough once you get a second upgrade on a unit you can choose to name it oh okay well, it's good enough, I guess. Yeah, I don't really I, usually rename my cities except when they're completely unremember. Like, I got 25 cities and now I can't remember them anymore. So this one's become Science 1. That one becomes Science 2. <laughs> <laughs> it does help. Uh, and the game does kind of encourage you to go, uh, not like, not build the same district in every city. Uh, I would say, at least in, from my experience so far in this game, you don't need... So in the like at least in Civ Five, it felt like you needed a ton of science all the time in order to like get the cool text and stuff like to progress through that game. You don't need a ton of science all the time, and you do need a standing army, unlike in Civ Five. Oh yeah, in Civ Five, you could get by with never having built a military unit. Yeah, you can't do that. The barbarians are mean, and they come quick. <laughs> so uh, yeah, recommend build some build some military units have have a standing military if it's not huge at least have some military units uh because like you know barbarians will just wander in out of nowhere and murder your town and it's, it goes really bad when that happens well you're gonna have to give us a follow-up next week yeah I, i'm sure i'll get to play some more um so i look forward to giving us uh exciting updates from the world of civilization all right well andrew really quick i guess let's go through the weekly talk of fantasy football. 
is it is it a talk or do we just sort of sit here and air hug each other through the internet because both of us are so bad at fantasy football this year yeah i didn't do so great uh i i'm in fifth place in our league uh and i lost to the seventh place team which doesn't sound that bad but when you hear the score um what was the score there buddy 133 to 86. Oh, come on. That's not that much to complain about. I won my game and both teams Hold on, hold on. Let's just stop 70. right there, Andrew. Did you say you won? You won though? Yeah. So that's pretty good celebration. Let's throw a party. Good job. You won. Uh, I don't feel like it's winning when both teams don't score 70 points. W's a W. Take that W. <laughs> I I guess it's just I so I played uh, Kevin in both mm-hmm. leagues this week. Oh, interesting. And, and in both leagues, Kevin and I scored both under seventy points with both Yikes. our teams, and I won both by less than five points. That's really bad. It's so terrible. That's bad. JJ, I'm assuming you own Mike Evans in one league. No? Nope. How'd that happen? I I didn't get him. I played against him this week, though. He destroyed me. Yeah. How many points did he get? Uh, Like 20 or something. Yeah. He got two touchdowns and like 100 yards, so that's a lot uh-huh. of points. Yep. Um, When you're struggling late in a season, you know, it's late, right? It's We're halfway through. Yep. And your team's near the bottom, but you have a decent team, and you just you need a change. You got to do something because you only have one starting running back, and that starting running back is Todd Gurley. And he's terrible. What do you got to do? I don't know. You got to make a trade. Mm hmm. And when you have a guy like Mike Evans, you can command a trade. You can get something like Matt Jones and Demarius Thomas. Demarius Thomas? Mm hmm. Because he's been kind of bad this season. That's fine. I got a receiver for my receiver and a starting running back. Okay. And then both of them, um, well, Demarius Thomas did okay. He got a touchdown. But that running back didn't do much of anything, considering he fumbled twice, and Mike Evans got 26 points. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, it's a tough uh, a tough season this year, for I sure. I cannot make a correct decision, man. Uh, I lost two of my three leagues. Uh, if you want to hear about a league where I lost, let's talk about my work league, the auction league. Uh, my opponent got... 156 I got 76 <laughs> now uh, let's put that in perspective that's not the highest score in the league there's a person in this league who got 157 so I didn't even lose to the person doing the best I I, I can't imagine how these teams are this bad both I'm leagues, headed to last place in that league both leagues I was projected over a hundred points. Yeah. What is happening? I mean, you I know, almost I, lost to a guy whose starting quarterback didn't play the whole game. You know, uh, I lost. Uh, I had the starting quarterback who went on IR in the second quarter in that, <laughs> that league. Uh, and, you know, uh, I still managed to put up 76 points on the back of the Philadelphia Eagles defense. Thank you, two touchdowns, for making my score not look completely horrible. I just look bad instead of looking like a complete dumpster fire, which my team is. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. I- I've been thinking for weeks that it's like, okay, just stay the course. Stay the course. It'll turn around. Nope. And then a guy like Odell Beckham scores 32 points, and you lose because you only get 58 points. And then the week after, you're like, okay, I made this huge trade. Uh, I'm set up. I've got two starting running backs. I've got a decent crop of wide receivers. I got a good quarterback. I've got the Minnesota defense. Odell Beckham four points. Everybody else three points. What is? What do you do? Just what do you do, man? The inconsistencies this year are insane. Yeah, it's tough. I don't. I don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, I, I'm obviously not doing super hot in uh, too many of my leagues either. Uh, I won in the one league uh, that I'm in, and that's because I own A.J. Green and the Philadelphia defense, who together combined for like 50 points. So, yeah, I mean, I won that one. Um, But 
you know, his quarterback was Russell Wilson, who basically didn't play, uh, even though he did play the whole game. Uh, and he had a couple guys put up near goose eggs uh, like Jordy Nelson on the Packers did. So, you know, it's just been real bad um, for kind of me in general this fantasy season, too. So I feel your pain, man. Well, I'd like to apologize to Kevin. Uh, at, least, at least your football team won. Yeah. Oh, hey, the Broncos did win, and that was a convincing win, I think. Yeah. I played Devontae Booker in one league. That was a good play. Yeah, 15-something points, I think. Yeah. Look, they looked like a football team, unlike that game that we saw in San Diego where they looked like asleep. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so take the win there. Take the two wins against Kevin, but I'll apologize to him for not handing him a convincing loss. I don't feel like he deserved to lose. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I noticed that uh, that my fiance knocked off the number one player in our league this week too. Ooh, all right, go yeah, Stephanie. I, I'm excited about that. Um, I don't think it's going to be enough to knock him out of first place though, because of that tie. Oh well. But uh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah, pretty I, good. I'm happy if she's uh, headed for for first place. And she's at least headed up, uh, and I'm pretty sure I'm headed down because I lost this week and she won. So. Well, I just want to see our league compact even more, where it's literally like one game from first to worst. Well, it's definitely not that, because our last place guy is losing. Uh, oh, no, he's not. He did win. Yep. So it, it it's the bottom of the league, is it's stratifying a little bit. Top two seem to be up there, because that tie. The top two players tied against each other. That's some, that's some collusion. <laughs> Gotta bleep that one, but I don't even care. <laughs> Man, not fair. Number one and number two both have the tie. So even if you beat one or the other of them, they both have to lose. The ah, ties are so unfair in this system. Man, it's so good. <laughs> Having a tie is so much better than a loss. Man. That's why you got to institute fractional scoring, man. PPR, go for it. It's so much better. Less ties. I remain unconvinced. You're unconvinced for a dumb reason that you like ties and you like losing. And you like hearing that, like, oh, nine yards isn't worth anything. That makes no sense to me. Look, look, we vote on it every year, and every year you lose. So but This was the first year I've tried to get people to vote on it, and I think only three people read it and cared. So, anyway. <laughs> you know, I, I, clearly the onus is on me. Uh, you know, it's just like the American political system. Got to get people to care about it, and it's hard to get people to mm -hmm. care. So. I can get you addresses if you want to send them all pamphlets. Not doing that. <laughs> I don't care that much. Oh, man. Well, I'm sure we'll be back here next week complaining about the same exact things, but hopefully maybe this is the beginning of some positivity. Like, I, I'd so Start hard to be rally, positive Andrew. with two wins and basically 100 points between S the two teams. Start a rally. Yeah. All right, well, rally time. Nice. Well, I'll have to save my last question for you for next week, which is fine because it'll be our Halloween episode and episode 26. Oh, all right, 26. Wherein I throw down with you about something I think you're wrong about that's not Skyrim. Okay, well, we'll look forward to finding out what JJ is wrong with next in the next episode <laughs> of We Were Gamers. But Andrew, in the meantime, how could people contact us? Uh, they can, I don't know, maybe try and howl at the moon since it's Halloween next week. Okay. I don't know that that's going to be completely successful, but <laughs> that is one thing you could try. If you wanted to use modern conveyance of communication and not tap into your wolf ancestry, you could do it at uh, facebook.com slash we were gamers. You could get a hold of us at podcast at we were gamers dot com. You can look at our awesome, mostly kind of complete website, wewergamers.com, or even follow us on Twitter where we post things that are mostly episode releases, but also other things that we find interesting at We Were Gamers and an Instagram. I will endeavor to post the beautiful, beautiful theme to Civilization VI that everyone should just listen to on repeat for the rest of their lives on it Twitter. It is really nice. Uh, from our account so that everyone can just bask in the glory of of that music nice well uh do you want to go play civ 6 or try out this brawl uh man, if we got some time that overwatch sounds kind of